Good morning, everyone. Everyone's doing well, yes? Yes, good. It's good to see you here today. We have uh, some special guests, and as you can see on the screens, this is a discipleship summit, and uh, we're talking about what that means here at Concordia. And the Concordia theme of all of this, as you probably already know, J2E3. How many of you know exactly what that means? A bunch of hands going up. Jesus, say it with me, Jesus, Jesus to, to everyone, everyone everywhere, everywhere, every, every day. day. That's it. That's how, that's how we roll, right? That's how we roll. So it's a wonderful thing. It's my privilege today to reintroduce to you a dear friend, Dr. John Tolson, who is the author of the book, The Four Priorities, that with which many of you have uh, great familiarity. Some of you are working through it with our group. That's where we're focused as well. We have a number of those books available at the, here at the uh, church again this morning. We'll talk about that later. And we are especially honored to have John's wife here today, Punky. And Thanks. so uh, uh, she brings, I, I, I will tell you a little bit, I, I know about Punky more than I know Punky, but we have met. I'll say. be careful what I say. These are <laughs> going to be good things. These are going to be good things. Um, in addition to bringing uh, a sense of beauty to, the, I, I think of, when I talk about reading, I think of beauty and the beast, and John, excuse me, but you and I probably both fit into the beast side of the equation here, but um, uh, insight into the work of discipleship, a marvelous love for the Savior, and uh, the dynamics of, of multiplication, getting started, getting going, and Punky, welcome. We're very Thank pleased you. to have I'm you here. I'm so glad to be here. John, welcome again. We are very pleased to have you here. Get, please, uh, Concordia, welcome for uh, John and Punky. They'll be leading our Bible class this morning, and I, it would be my privilege to start us off with a word of prayer, and then, guys, it's all yours. Thank Please you. pray with me. Father, we thank you for this day. It's a beautiful day, and we are so privileged to come together to sing your praises in worship, to be instructed in, through, in, in, through your word by Pastor Tucker, and now in this Bible class time to invite John and Punky to speak to us about this important matter. Jesus to everyone, everywhere, every day. Somehow that comes ringing down to us from a Mount post-resurrection when Jesus said, make disciples of all peoples, and it comes and resonates within our hearts. This is our moment. This is our time, and we thank you for that. Bless John and Punky as they speak to us today, and we pray this in Jesus' strong and precious name. Yes. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. I Good morning. Tell you what, uh, you've got a, a dear guy right here. Uh, Steve and I have gotten to know each other over the last year, and I've gotten to know Bill as well, Tucker. And I've been around a long time, and you've got some phenomenal people, these two, and the rest of your staff. But, Steve, you're a jewel, and what a heart you have for people, for the Lord, and uh, thank you for letting us be here. Uh, we're not here to uh, waste your time. Uh, and our real uh, work starts tonight uh, in the seminar. And Steve, you're going to tell everybody about that and then tomorrow night. Uh, but we're not here to uh, just fill up uh, space for another Sunday morning. We're here to encourage and equip you to take this city for Christ. Nothing mm -hmm. short of that. And if we don't understand the day and the time in which we're living in this world and in our own country, then our heads are literally in the sand. We are here to equip you to make a difference that uh, has never been made in this city before. And so we'll talk about that tonight and tomorrow night, and we're looking forward to that. But what we wanted to do this morning was to get a chance to, for you to know a little bit about us, uh, who we are, and uh, then you can decide if you want to come back tonight. You may not <laughs> like us. You I don't like those people. That's fine. But we're kind of crazy. We, we smile a lot. We laugh a lot. We act a little silly. So if you're not into that kind of stuff, then you can just turn your back like the police did in New York and go the other way. So anyway, um, I was born in Ohio. Uh, my mom and dad were divorced when I was two years old, and I didn't have the privilege of having uh, a father in my home the first couple of years. My mom was, uh, I guess, uh, I think I was around seven when she remarried, and my, unfortunately, my stepfather had no idea of what it meant to be a, uh, a father. So literally, I was without a father. And those of you that have grown up that way, you'll understand 
uh, that it's a huge, huge void in a person's life. Is there something making noise? What do I do? I'm just not good with these things, man. I'm sorry. Hold on just a second. You want me to use that? Babe, your earring fell off. My earring. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, has that? Let's try it again. Okay. Right, I got a great story about an earring. That's why he needs by me. By the way, <laughs> except it wasn't mine. <clears throat> so anyway, um, I remember. I don't know how many of you seen the movie The Rookie uh, with Dennis Quaid about the baseball pitcher. I've probably seen it ten times. If you haven't seen it, then you need to go rent it or watch it or whatever. But there, it's about a father uh, and a son who do not have a good relationship. And it wouldn't be surprising to me if there aren't those of you in the room that did not have, maybe still don't have, a good relationship with your father. And uh, this, and, and it, when I start watching the beginning of the movie, having gotten into it, I, I begin literally to weep because of the hole, I think, that's in our hearts when we don't have a father that's invested deeply in our lives. 99.9% .9 of my memories of my stepfather are negative. And not one time in my life until he had one day to live did he ever say the words, I love you. So it's tough. It's a tough deal. So that's kind of how I grew up. And I think that's one of the reasons why over the years the Lord has given me uh, what I focus on. And I'll tell you about that in a moment. But anyway, I uh, had a chance to um, go to college in Arizona to play basketball and baseball. My family was extremely poor. They had no way of sending me to school. But I had an uncle that taught me how to... I shoot a basketball and throw a baseball, and through an incredible set of circumstances, uh, I was able to go to school and get an education. Nobody in my background, my family background, had ever gone to a college or a university. I was the first one. Uh, when I graduated, I signed a contract to coach and thought that's what I was going to do in a college in Mississippi. And that summer, I was working with students in my home in Florida. I grew up in Bradenton, Florida. I moved there when I was about seven or eight which was nice because I was only 10 minutes from the, from the beach, and I spent a lot of time on the beach. Um, and that summer, working with the students, high school kids, we saw tons of kids in my little town come to know Christ. And the Lord gripped my heart during that summer and basically said to me, uh, you're not supposed to go coach. You're supposed to coach in a different way. I was a very competitive person. Uh, I would compete at throwing paper wads and a trash can from 10 feet away or a basketball or anything, I, I had to win. That was kind of part of my insecurity, and that's what made me feel significant by winning. I hope I've outgrown a lot of that over the years. But nonetheless, uh, I, somebody said, you need to go to seminary. I said, what's that? He said, that's where you go if you want to be a preacher. I said, I don't even like those people. I don't want to be a preacher. But that's what I did. I went to seminary for three years, and after that, for 15 years, I worked with high school students. And then, and I'll tell you more tonight about uh, what followed from that, but in the last 37, almost going on 40 years now, I have primarily given my life uh, to men in our country. And one of the, the works that goes on in this city, we started 20-some years ago. Uh, Ken, where are you? Where's Ken Olson? Raise your hand. It's real high so they can see you. I cannot see you, Ken. Way in the back, he's a very humble man. Ken uh, was in Orlando. We became dear friends. He came to our gathering of men, outreaches and lunches and so forth there. He moved here uh, 25 years ago, whatever it was, and called me one day and said, will you help us start uh, the gathering of men in San Antonio? So Ken and a group of guys have been running that for 20-some years now in this city, literally have touched thousands of men and leaders in this city through their outreaches. So um, that's what I have really spent my time on. In the last um, uh, 11 years almost, I've been in, with my wife in, uh, in Dallas, and we'll talk about more of that tonight. So anyway, to kind of get to the point that I really want to talk, part I really want to talk about. So um, uh, in 1968, <clears throat> I married a phenomenal lady uh, from my hometown, Bradenton, Florida. Her name was Ruth Ann, and Ruth Ann uh, had been raised in that community. Uh, her daddy was one of the first nine doctors in Bradenton, Florida. If you go there now, the hospital is named after him. He delivered over 4,000 babies in that little town in over his years. And he was 
one of the last doctors I ever knew who would still make a house call. And I remember one day he said, John, get in the car with me. We need to drive out of town about 15 miles. out back into this orange grove, and there was this little shack back there. And uh, he said, we need to go see how this man's doing. He was a true family doctor and physician. So um, Ruth Ann and I were married going into my last year of graduate school. And then we were married uh, for 30 years. But in 1995, one evening, uh, my beautiful wife of 30 years had a stroke. Uh, she was a diabetic, but really took care of herself. And so that was really a game changer. And she had to be in the hospital for 30 days in rehab to learn to walk again, uh, to learn to talk again. But what she was left with was a thing I called thalamic syndrome. The bleeding was in her brain near the thalamus. And the thalamus, I'm told by physicians, is where you sense hot or cold, etc. Her perception was that the whole left side of her body, she said, is like a hot iron is on it 24 hours a day. We went everywhere in the United States to try to get help, from Duke University to, to NIH, everywhere. And um, we were about a week away from going back to Duke to, they were going to go down into her brain to manipulate the thalamus, and they said, we think we might be able to help, but it's, you know, it, we really don't know until we try it. Um, the last four years uh, of her life were absolutely horrible. Night and day, uh, she had that heat, that sensation of heat on her face and arm and foot, ear, um, and she battled the diabetes. Finally, the last year of her life, she had to go on dialysis, so I had to take her to the dialysis center three or four times a week and sit with her for four hours while she went through that, uh, and I won't even go into all the other things that happened. But in, on February at the 1st, she had another stroke, and... Uh, went home to be with the Lord. Very difficult time, not only for my kids, but it was a very difficult time for me. I don't like hospitals. And when the hospital comes to your home, then you got to deal with it. So I had to learn to deal with it. I still don't like hospitals. Um, and so uh, 30 years of, of, of an amazing, amazing marriage. And I wrote some things down here about her. And I, and I, and the amazing thing about Punky is I try not to bring Ruth Ann up a lot, but when I do, she honors her also, which takes an incredible woman sitting on my left here to be able to honor somebody else that she really never knew but only knew of. Uh, but, my, but Ruth Ann was uh, wise. She was funny. Uh, she taught me, uh, tried to teach me things that I just didn't learn growing up, like writing thank you notes uh, like uh, learning how to say my verbs correctly, even though I was an, Eng an English minor. I'll never forget one day, she, I, I messed some verb up, and she said, listen, one day you might be standing before uh, some leaders in this country, and you need to get your verbs right, or they ain't going to listen to you. So interestingly enough, about uh, 11 years ago, Punk and I were in Washington, and I was standing before the Senate of the United States uh, saying a prayer and a lot of other opportunities graciously the Lord has brought along over the years. So she was a, an amazing lady and, and you would have loved her and, and Ruth Ann would have loved her. I mean, Punky would have loved her as well. She would have loved Punky. So that, that was a real, real key part of my life. And then I guess for the next eight months, nine months after that, I basically worked hard, stayed busy took my son uh, and my daughter on a little getaway and my daughter's uh, husband and uh, we just tried to kind of get moving again uh, because when you care for somebody like many of you have, it was 24 hours a day, 27 days a week for four years. And in the middle of the night, I never knew what was going to happen or how many times I'd have to call 911 that week for the ambulance to come. Uh, it, it was just crazy. So it was um, about eight or nine months to kind of get my head back on again, get my heart right, and uh, begin to uh, move on if, you're po if it's possible to do that. My kids called after about eight or nine months, Kristen and Luke, and they said, Dad, Mom wouldn't want you just to be sitting around not thinking about uh, having your eyes open if the Lord brought you somebody. 
and that kind of freed me up to keep my eyes open. Uh, so um, I started getting some cakes, casseroles. Somehow they appeared on my front steps. <laughs> people started calling, calling me, trying to for me to meet people. And, I, and like I said in my note here, I said I met a lot of, of really nice ladies. But I knew in one dinner if I had any interest or not. They probably knew at the door whether they had any interest in me. I'm not sure. But nonetheless, um, after a, a bit of time, um, I talked to s some dear friends, Sandy Hall and uh, Fred Hall, who was my veterinarian for my dog Bubba for many years. Um, and they basically said, we've been holding somebody back on you. And I said, well, who would that be? And they said, well, her name is Punky. And they said, she's back from uh, L.A. She's been an actress. And uh, she's working here in her hometown in Orlando. And you need to meet her. So I'm going to stop it right there for a second and let Punky kind of tell you where she was up to that point, and then we'll kind of pick it back up. Thank you, sweetie. Um, I wanted to say before I get into my part of the story that the reason John and I are sharing our stories today is because we all have a story. And central to our story, if we are believers, is Jesus. And without Jesus, we got no story. Amen? He is the story, if you will. And so the reason I bring that up is because when you think about disciple making and making disciples and raising up men and women to be followers of Jesus Christ, raising them up to build a foundation of faith in their life, that can be very daunting to us, can't it? But God has given us a door opener, and our door opener is our story. If you, go, if you remember, if you've, if you've read the book of Revelation or studied it at all, um, in, the, in the end part of, of that book, um, John describes um, the, the saints who overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. So basically that's what Jesus has done for us on the cross. We got the blood of the Lamb, right? And the word of our testimony. That's our story. That's our story. So he's given us two things that are door openers. And you'll find probably um, already many of you in this room can relate better to John because he just told you part of his story. There are things about our story that sometimes we don't like to tell and things that we think don't matter to anybody or things we'd rather have people not know about us. But let me tell you, that's the, precisely the kind of things that the Lord wants to use for you, because the very thing that has worked against you in your life, in your story, is the very thing that he wants to take and redeem or turn it around and work for you and also to bless others. Um, anybody in here ever read um, the uh, devotionals, uh, Streams in the Desert? Anybody familiar with Streams in the Desert? So there was a, um, an entry, um, um, uh, well, years ago I, when I was reading it, and, and there was a man named A.B. Simpson, and she would quote him over and over throughout Streams in the Desert. So I started to really get interested in A.B. Simpson, and I won't give you his background, but um, he wrote um, many things, and he was a preacher, but he wrote a um, devotional called Days of Heaven on Earth, and I started really reading that and studying it, and I loved what he said. But yesterday I was reading this, and I thought of you all, and I'm just going to read part of it. When God does anything marked or special for our souls or bodies, he intends it as a sacred trust for us to communicate to others. Freely you have received, freely give. give. Freely give. If God has revealed himself to us as sanctifier, it is that we may help others to him as sanctifier. If he has become our healer, it is because there are sick and suffering people to whom we can bring some blessing. In like manner, if the hope of the Lord's coming has become precious to us in any way, it would be worse than ingratitude for us to hide our testimony to this truth and hold it only for our own personal comfort. And that's why we're sharing our story or our testimony with you. So like John, I grew up in a dysfunctional family. Anybody grow up in a dysfunctional family? Anybody in a dysfunctional family? I don't know anybody who has never been or never had a dysfunctional family. We all have dysfunction of some sort. And the thing that I love so much about dysfunction is that right in the middle of that word is the word 
fun. And so you can have fun even if you have a dysfunctional family, and I did. We were very dysfunctional, <coughs> highly emotionally, spiritually, physically, mentally dysfunctional, but we also had a lot of fun as well. But I grew up in a home. I was the oldest of five children. I grew up in Orlando, Florida. Um, I say Punky is my real name because I've been called that all of my life, but I was given the name Karen at birth, perfectly lovely name. It means pure at heart, and I've always thought maybe I'm just trying to live up to that name. But um, we know that that's only God that works that. But my sweet daddy, who went home to be with the Lord in 2010, um, started calling me Punky, basically when I came home from the hospital, and it stuck. So the only people that ever call me Punky are doctors or, or police officers, or the only people that ever call me Karen, rather, are doctors or police officers, and hopefully there's not too many police officers, but we um, uh, had this crazy dysfunctional family, but throughout my growing up years, I can never remember a time when I did not believe in Jesus, and although we were Christians um, in that we were not Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist or Jewish, we were Christians and we would go to church occasionally. My mom was raised Catholic, my dad was Presbyterian, and so we would go pretty much C and A, Christmas and Easter, and and sort of like around baptism time. And so um, uh, my mom would teach us prayers, and I, I always had a sense of of God and, and really started to know about Jesus through vacation Bible school that my mom would take us. Because when you have five kids, you got to do something with them in the summertime. And she would drive us to this uh, Methodist church down the street and we would go to vacation Bible school. So um, very early on, I can remember praying. I had a sick puppy dog one time and the, the vet said he's probably not going to make it. And I um, heard that puppy crying all night long and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed for for Jesus to heal that puppy, and the next morning that puppy was fine and he healed. And that was the first time I can remember having um, to beg God for something, and 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 He did it. He heard my prayer and He and He healed my dog. And that's significant because um, that really uh, cemented in me something that later on in my life would benefit me. And that is, I know God hears me, and I know God answers prayer. And those two things will take you a long way if you know that. So I got into um, high school and um, was in um, a group called Young Life. Y'all familiar with Young Life? And that is where I made my public profession of faith because I understood that you need to um, really invite the Lord into your life to receive him as your savior and make that public, make that known. And so I wanted to do that and I did that. And um, I was uh, part of a group of young people in my high school that started um, the chapter um, organization at our high school for Fellowship of Christian Athletes, if you're familiar with that. And so I had a Christian friends. I had strong believing friends. I had a friend I'd spend the night with on the weekends, and she would take me to um, church, and I got involved in that youth group. And um, when I came to Christ and really was sold out to him I, um, in high school, I made all kinds of promises to God. Anybody ever make promises to God? I made all kinds of promises to God about how I would live my life, how pure I would keep my life, what I would do for him. And I graduated from high school, and within the first year of college, I had broken nearly every one of those promises. And I think, looking back on it now, had I had somebody walking with me and discipling me and someone to put their spiritual arm around me and help me grow up in the faith, I may not have made those choices. They were dumb choices. They were stupid choices, horribly unwise, some of them very risky and life-threatening and very shameful. I was, um, I came out of, as I said, this home where we were dysfunctional, but we were dysfunctional to this point. There was a lot of physical abuse. There was um, a lot of verbal abuse. There was, um, uh, a lot of emotional abuse from name calling and um, belittling and threatening. And when I got out of school, I wanted to run away from that as fast as I could and run into the arms of something or someone that would make that all better, where I could escape from it. And I didn't know enough about the Lord, nor was I... Um, 
had, had I been in, instructed in his word enough to know that he was the one I'd run to. He was my hiding place. And so for me, it became about finding an earthly love, finding a man's love, you know, somebody with flesh on their bones that, that could actually make it all go away. But anytime we go looking for something else to satisfy us in the way that only God can do, number one, it's an idol. Number two, it ain't going to satisfy us. Anybody, am I preaching to anybody that knows what I'm talking about? Okay. It's, and so what happens is we become very addicted to that. And so I began to, to seek more things to try to satisfy, just to try to find that peace, to try to find that love, because I thought that was the answer. Um, got involved in very wrong relationship. That took me way off track. Um, finally, at the, toward the end of my 20s, I still was not married and desperately, desperately wanted to be married because I thought that would be the answer. If I could just find somebody to marry me, all of my problems would be solved. And as you all know in this room, if you're married, when you get married, all your problems are solved, aren't they? <laughs> Lots just begin, too, but <laughs> so um, I um, was desperate to, to, to be married and so distraught that I wasn't. So at the end of my 20s, I decided, okay, I'm 29. I do not want to be 39 and say, why didn't I ever you know, fill in the blank? So I, I decided I was going to pursue the entertainment industry, get out of corporate America where I was working and pursue the entertainment industry because I had always dreamed of doing that, and I thought that would be fun to act, and I'd done a little bit of that in school. So I uh, pursued it, and doors opened right away. I had quite a bit of success in the Southeast, um, uh, where there was a lot of film and television production, and it was Florida was a right-to-work state, so I, I worked a lot, and it seemed like God was opening doors opening doors. And throughout this time, I'm living this duplicitous life. I'm really, really um, kidding myself um, about my relationship with Jesus, but yet I'm going to church. I'm teaching uh, fifth grade Sunday school, um, learning more from the kids than, than I am teaching them, obviously. And um, uh, it just um, was, it, it, I, I began to be very, very much aware of the fact that I was living duplicitously. It, it gets to be a drain when we straddle that fence. It gets to be um, really a burden when we try to keep it, keep it right on Sunday, and then Monday hits, and we go down the tubes. And again, had I had somebody with their arm around me telling me, you know what, you're going to make mistakes, but guess what? You can recorrect your course like that by just saying, Lord, I need you. Forgive me for what I've been doing, forgive me for what my sin, and help me to start again. We get a clean slate the minute we say that, and that is good news, isn't it? That's just so, somebody needs to hear that today. And so I just, I want to say something else that I, I think somebody might need to hear, and that is, as you've listened to me so far, I publicly made my profession of faith in high school. At that point, I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. My name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. My eternity was set, right? And the greatest sins, although I don't believe God ranks sin, sin is sin, but the greatest sins of my life happened after I received Jesus. Anybody? But this I know about Jesus because he loves us so. He's, he never looks at that and turns and runs away. He never looks at that and says, that's it. You don't get another chance. He is the God of second, third, fourth, tenth, fifteenth, one hundred, one hundred and fiftieth chances as, as whatever it takes to get us into that place where we finally turn to him and say, I need you more than I need anything else. And so that point came for me in my mid-30s. I was still unmarried, still desperately wanted to be married. Um, I had been out in Los Angeles for a year uh, working, came home to try to save another disastrous relationship, and um, that crashed and burned, and it left me in a place where um, I actually was clinically depressed. 
um, read a book by a woman named Sheila Walsh, if you know Sheila Walsh, and she shares her testimony, and um, her first, first book called Honestly, and my uh, cousin gave me that book, and I read it, and she talks about her clinical depression and described me to a T, and I um, I had a good friend in Orlando who said, um, you need to get in a Bible study. And she took me to this Bible study. It was very small. And she said, um, there's um, uh, this, it's this really interesting Bible study. There's this woman that she, she teaches on a videotape. And if you can get over her hair and her accent, she really has a lot of good things to say. And it was Beth Moore. And it was, <laughs> she's, have you heard of her? Yes. <laughs> I'm kidding. So she um, it was our very first Bible study, and um, uh, I, I remember listening to her and thinking, okay, she's got something going on with Jesus I have never heard before. Like, I got in my car, I bawled all, my way, all the way home, and I said, if what she has is real, I want that. I want that with you. If that's real, because I had seen a lot of phony Christians. I had worked for a Christian magazine publisher, and I had worked in uh, the, the business of Christianity for a long time with, with televangelists and things, at one portion of my life. And I thought, if this is the real deal, I want it, because I haven't heard, I hadn't heard anybody talk about Jesus the way she did. So um, I, uh, I had gotten to a point where um, the duplicity had um, become too much for me, and I finally got to where I think this is where uh, people will call it the end of yourself. Anybody ever been to the end of yourself? I did not have a breakdown or anything, but I was face down. And I literally was face down on the floor of my bedroom, face in the hardwood floors, which is a, a good place to be sometimes. It's a really good place to be. And I said, I give up. And I've often said that those are the three words that really changed my life. They really turned my life in the other direction, and I believe that's so what the Lord was really waiting for from me was for me to just completely surrender. I had been holding on to this way of life and kind of dancing over here with him a little bit and then holding on to this. And so it was really letting go of this and taking hold of that which Christ, for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me and trying to really, really um, um, develop that relationship with him that I'd always desired and never had. And so I remember getting up off the floor and just feeling like a tremendous weight had been lifted. And I said, Lord, if you love me the way you say you do in your word, and if you want to be everything you say that you want to be to me in your word, then come on in and do it because I'm sick and tired of trying. And I was really sick, and I was really tired. And somewhere along the line, as I was studying his word, um, it came to me to pray to fall in love with him. And I thought, that's really interesting, Lord, because I have fallen in love with just about every kind of man out there. Emotionally unavailable, spiritually unavailable, socially unavailable. I mean, just, you know, whatever. I've fallen in love, but I've never really tried to fall in love with you. And so I began praying that I would fall in love with him. And got up off my knees, nothing happened. Prayed it again the next night, got up off my knees, nothing happened. A couple months later, I realized I was coming home from work at night, and I couldn't wait to crawl up in bed with a bowl of cereal, grab my Bible, and just pour over his word. It had become so precious to me. It had become like, like um, Jeremiah says, um, when you seek me, you will find me. When you search for me with all your heart, it really means when you search for him as a vital necessity for life. He had really become a vital necessity for my life, and that had never happened before. And so I began this beautiful relationship and this beautiful dance with the Lord, and that was again in my late 30s by this time. Still not married, still wanted very much to be married. Um, started teaching Bible study. Some um, friends from my church, and I was in an Episcopal church, said, we really need a women's Bible study here, so why don't you start one here? So we started doing Beth Moore things at first, and then they asked me if I would start teaching. And so I would start write a little bit of something, and I would teach and share. But I, I just loved doing that. And I found that at my work, I would have girls that I worked with just come drop by my office to for a word of encouragement and just 
going through something with their boyfriends or their husbands or their kids, and they would come by and talk, and I'd be able to encourage them, and I really enjoy doing that. So long before I met John and understood what discipleship and disciple-making was all about, I was doing that on one level. Um, I uh, had, through my Bible teaching, come to um, a particular place where I was um, talking about idols and things that become the thing that you want more than you want God. And the Lord revealed to me, um, just in my prayer time, just to my heart, didn't speak in an audible way, but spoke to my heart. And we know when he speaks to us in our heart. We can, we can tell. It's different. And, and I, I just um, heard him say to my heart, um, you've made an idol out of marriage. And I agreed. It resonated. It hurt, but it resonated. And so that began my prayer um, to surrender it. And I said, Lord, I, I'm going to put this on your altar because more than what I want I want what you want for me. I want to be married more than anything, but if I want it more than I want you, then I'm going to lay it down. And it hurts me to do that, and it scares me to do that. But even if I'm not meaning this sincerely in my heart right now, I'm going to begin praying it to mean it. And that is, I truly do want more to have you than anything else. More than what I want, I want what you want for me. And, you know, um, friends this morning, I think that is the prayer God honors. I'm not saying if you pray that way, you'll get what you were asking and laid down. It did end up that I did get married. But in the process of surrendering that, the Lord was able to show me more about himself, more about myself, and take me further still, take me deeper with him. And so um, I really began praying then to learn to be content, like Paul talks about, in Philippians 4, learning to be content whether we have much, whether we have little, whether we're well-fed, whether we're not, whether we're married, whether we're not, whether we have a baby, whether we don't, whether we have a job, whether we don't. So I learned, I was practicing learning contentment. And I got a phone call from a friend who was in my Bible study, and she said, are you dating someone? I would love for you to meet my friend John Tolson. And I had heard about John Tolson. He taught a large Sunday school class. He was a pastor on staff at a big Presbyterian church in Orlando, downtown, where a lot of my friends went. And he taught this large Sunday school class, and I had friends from time to time say, you really should come to our Sunday school class because you could meet some guys there. There's a lot of guys there. And I'm like, I didn't know Sunday school class was like dating central. So I'm like, I just don't do that kind of thing. So um, uh, I had heard about him and uh, knew that he had lost his wife um, um, about a year earlier and had remembered at the time when that happened thinking, wow, that's just so sad to me that someone who's that had that kind of an impact on people and he you know, struggled so much and um, just had that thought ab- about him. And uh, my uh, grandmother had passed away and I'd given the eulogy at her memorial service and a friend of my aunt's had had heard me and she said, I'd really like to fix Punky up with John Tolson. So they, they said this afterwards to me and I said, John Tolson, isn't he like preacher downtown? I'm not dating a preacher. I said, no, I'm not marrying a preacher. And to which my uncle said, no one said anything about marrying him. They just said, you should date him. And I think you should. He's a man's man. He's a good guy. You should go out with him. So when this friend of mine called me to go out with him, I was like, uh, I heard he was dating somebody else. I heard he was almost married. Oh, they've broken up, she says. So I said, well, all right, you can give him my number. So do you want to take it? Let me pick it up right there. Okay. Okay. That's beautiful. That's great. Uh, Yeah, just let me take a minute here. Um, (laughs) uh, uh, So uh, I got her number and made the call. And I said, I hear you're crazy. And she said, yep. I said, well, I am too. I said, I can't go out with you if you're not fun, if you're not crazy. I don't want to go sit out and just look at each other and try to figure out what to say. You've got to have some game. She said, okay, let's go. So we set up the uh, time. I think it was a week later. And uh, the Saturday of that evening, we're to have the, the dinner uh, that morning, I get a phone call. Actually, I had already sent her a note, and I said, all right, we're going to such and such a restaurant. I said, I'm going to just be casual, wear a pair of khakis, da 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 I'll pick you up at 7. And right after that, I get a phone call from the old girlfriend. 
And I hang with mine not seen for, I'm not sure how long. That's where y'all go, ooh. Yeah. Well, somebody else was doing that too. <laughs> so anyway, she said, how are you doing? I said, not too well. I said, how are you doing? She said, not too well. She said, you want to go to dinner, go to a movie? I said, yep. So I called her <laughs> number again. Punky, mm. John Tolson here. Sorry, I can't come go tonight. Da, 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 da. And your response was? I hear this, and I, first, my first thought is, old girlfriend is back in the picture, totally. Like, you don't, like, almost marry somebody and then, like, break we up and, no. and, and all good to go the following week. I'm and I told my friend this, that. Don't say that. Yeah, no. That's, <laughs> dude, he's recording it, too. We got it all down. Yeah. Oh. But, no, it, you, you, and I just knew it was the old girlfriend was back in the picture. Yeah, so anyway, um, I was a little uncomfortable at the time. So um, after that weekend, I, and by the way, she starts calling everybody she knows, and they got a group, groups together all over town uh, putting some bad stuff on me. So now, that, was, now that is really not true. It's kind of true, yeah. <laughs> no, it's I mean, not. The vine got going. So anyway, <laughs> I call back the next week, and you can kind of talk about the phone calls. Well, I had been going back and forth to Los Angeles for some work that I was doing at the time, and... Um, that was back before we all had cell phones a attached to our, our bodies. And uh, I would check my answering machine. Remember those? I would check my answering machine periodically, and it was like I got there on the weekend, and I didn't check it till like Wednesday, and there were seven messages from him <laughs> saying, Hey, Punky, this is your neighbor, John Tolson. <laughs> we just wanted to see if you, you know, wanted to get coffee. Sure, I'm sorry about last weekend. And Beep, another message. Hey, Punky, it's, it's John Tolson. Um, friend John Tolson, would you like to get dinner tomorrow night? I mean, there was message after message after message, and I'm like, this guy thinks I'm totally blowing him off, and, and he can think that until I get back in town. So I didn't call him back until I got back. <coughs> you know why? He can wait. So I called him when I got back, and I said, I'm, I'm back in town. I've been at it on the West Coast. And so um, he said, you know, can we try this again? And I said, sure, you know, next, next weekend's fine. And um, that's when we realized that we lived right. Don't say it. Don't okay. tell that part. So, so I asked her, and she said, we dispute how this happened, but I like my side, my story better. So she said, uh, slightly embellished I said, how did I get to your house? Your she said, back out of your driveway, go left three houses to the stop sign, take a left on the second house on the right. I mean, it wasn't even a nine iron. It was unbelievable. <laughs> See, I that had, makes it sound like I was some sort of stalker and I already knew where he lived. She actually did. Well, anyway, <laughs> so, uh, so I picked her up, and when I walked to the door and, and she opened the door, I had to be honest. She took my breath away. Man, I mean, she, so anyway, the, the meal that night was good, too. But anyway, so go talk about the meal <laughs> that, that evening. Well, so we went to a, a restaurant We're and uh, got there, and John had asked if a certain couple was in the restaurant and he said yes they're celebrating her birthday and he goes great I'd like to pay for their dinner and I thought oh, that's so sweet that's a really nice and so we go and sit down and um, have our dinner and uh, we're ordering our dinner looking at the menu but we're talking and we're having a great conversation and I was like this guy's really you know love talking to him he's he's deep you know it's not just the typical first date kind of stuff and so um, but in the course of um, reading the menus um, and talking, he um, would, you know, respond to something and, you know, and kind of look at me and then, but he would prop his glasses up on his forehead. And then when he would look back at the menu, he would drop his glasses back on his nose and he kept doing that and doing that. And I have no clue what he said, you know, after that, because I was like, well, how did he get those glasses on his forehead? How did he get them to stick like that? So that was, I was fascinated by, I was fascinated by that. I, how? How do it work? And so um, that didn't cause me to fall in love with him. I was just fascinated but by that. Close. So, it yeah, I was second, close. Yeah. And so uh, we're finishing up our dinner, and this couple walks over and says, Thank you very much for, for paying for our dinner. It's so nice of you. You know, happy birthday, happy birthday. And they, he introduced me, and, and they go off. And, and so then John had said, um, You know, hey, I, I know you like to laugh a lot. I've got this friend who's a Christian comedian, and I've got some some videotapes, remember those? Videotapes of his, and uh, would you like to come back to my house and watch them? And I'm thinking, oh my goodness,
this. So the preacher boy is asking me back to his house on the first date. This this is interesting. So I'm gonna go just to see, you know. So we go, and I, I figure, you know, I live around the corner, so I I can probably outrun him. I'll just you know run home. So so I um, we get there, and he sits on a chair over there, and I'm on the couch, and he puts these tapes at Ken um, Davis. Davis. And um, he is laughing so hard, throwing himself back on the chair, laughing. I'm like, he was funnier than the guy on TV. <laughs> so then he took me home. And, and then, do you want to say what you did le- later, later that night? Why don't you tell him? So I then like I find part. this out after the fact, but that he and the guy that was at the restaurant with his wife, that was all set up. Now, okay, now how junior high is this? He, he planned that so that his friend could check me out. Then he takes me home, and then they get together, and they go to Steak and Shake at, like, midnight and discuss. <laughs> <laughs> what is up with that? And you were, like, 50 what? How old were you then? <coughs> and so... That hurts right there. So, okay. um... Yeah. That's, I'm in it for life, babe. That's okay. That's great. So, um... He, yeah, so they, I guess I got thumbs up because here I sit. Oh, it so. was a big thumbs up. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, well, you have to have a buddy to walk with you. Right. So he was walking with me. So we that. dated for about, well, that was April we started dating. So we dated until the following April, and John had been struggling with, you know, just kind of making that decision to get over the hump. And he, we were really praying about getting married, but he decided he couldn't make that decision. And he came over one Friday night, and we talked and we cried and we prayed and and he broke up with me and um uh and he left and that was friday night and the following let me pick it up okie dokie okay so and it was hard because uh and punky and i've talked about this a lot and let's say say five minutes to talk kind of wrap some other things up okay um I lost my concentration there because this other girl, even though I never saw her or dated her again, she was on my mind. I really, at one point, really cared for her and really knew through friends that I talked with who came to me, she wasn't the right one. And personal experience, she was not the right one. Fine person, but not the right one for me. So, uh, but psychologically, mentally, somewhat emotionally, still there. So that was the hump I was trying to get over. I had to be clean from that. So anyway, um, it was a Wednesday night after that Friday night when I went over and said, Punky, I've got to move on. It's not fair to you. And she was putting absolutely no pressure on me, zero pressure. It was all me. I wanted to make a decision. So uh, it's Wednesday night. I go to my favorite little seafood place. I'm sitting in the back of this little dumpy restaurant with a bowl of gumbo and a book, kind of feeling sorry for myself. And saying, what an idiot. Right around the corner from me, five houses away, is one of the most amazing ladies I've ever met, and I'm going to go home by myself. So on the way home, it was dark now, I said, I'm just going to drive by her house on the way home. I didn't have to do that, but I'm going to drive by. Well, she was painting her living room, so she had all the drapes down so I could see her in her painting. That's therapy painting. Therapy painting. She would like to be painting me probably, but anyway, (laughs) so... So I drive by, take a right, take a left into my driveway. I'm sitting there. I didn't turn the car off. I'm just sitting there. I said, okay, Lord, what in the world? What's holding me back? And all of a sudden, it's like the Lord just said, hey, it ain't that big a deal. You're just, you're just afraid. You don't want to make a mistake. You were married for 30 years, and you don't want to make a mistake. And I said, okay, Lord, I'm either going to turn my car off and go in the house, and that's it. Or I'm going to call Punky, go over, and ask her if she will marry me. So I prayed and picked the phone up, and I was like, mm. dialed it. <laughs> hey, Punky, this is your friend John Tolson. <laughs> and you said. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> exactly. And, um, <laughs> Just like that. He said, I. I have something I wanted to talk to you about. Can I come over? And I said, well, I must, yeah, I must be nuts. I need my head examined, but yeah, come on over. So, and I was mad, so mad. And so he came over my and was smoking. I can tell you that right now. I had on like work, sweaty workout clothes, hair up and a ponytail, had been painting, 
had, you know, books stacked up on the sofa, magazines. And so he comes over and I pick up the magazines and I just pick them up and drop them on the floor. He's like, With it, some force. well, if you're going to start throwing things around, then maybe I just need to come back. And I'm like, just sit down and tell me what you came here to talk about. So he says, <laughs> well, I knew I'd made a mistake last Friday night when I was pulling out of the driveway and I've done things just backward and I I'm I thought about it and it, you know kind of the same things he he told you all just you know uh, I realized you know you are such an incredible woman I love you and um, I can spend the rest of my life without you but I don't want to and so I'm not here to ask you to get back together with me I'm here to ask you to marry me and I just stared at him. And I felt like God had me by the throat saying, if you make one smart aleck remark, I'm going to take you out right now. And we're going to have a face-to-face for good. And so, um, I mean, the Lord really, in this period of time from Friday to Wednesday, had really dealt with my pride. And so he starts the whole thing over again, repeating the whole thing. And he said, so I'm not here to ask you to get back together with me. I'm here to ask you to marry me. And I said, are you asking me or are you just telling me this? Are you really asking me? And he said, no, I'm asking you if you'll marry me, if you'll be my wife. And, and I said, of course I will, yes, because I really had a long, you know, maybe, you know, months before that, really felt the Lord telling me this is the one. But see, sometimes it's just not easy. Sometimes it's just not, you know, there's stuff we got to work through. And we both had things to work through. And so we got engaged, and we told our family, Easter was that weekend, and we told our, our family on, um, on Easter. Um, but that Friday, that good Friday, I was finishing up painting in my house, and I was, um, had been off work, and um, I just started crying. And I, out of nowhere, I'm like, what, Lord, what am I crying for? I just, this is the happiest time of my life. Why am I crying? And I, and I just started dialoguing with the Lord out loud and just said, I guess, you know, I guess I'm a little afraid, Lord. I'm just afraid that it's always been me and you. And I'm not sure if I know how to love John and love you together. And the Lord just to my heart, again, just said, it's always going to be me and you, punky, but you are going to have to work hard to keep it that way. And I think that's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 7 when he says, you know, when you get married, it's a good thing, but now the husband's got the cares of the wife and the wife's got the cares of the husband. And, and you've got to fight to keep the main thing the main thing. And so we got engaged, and um, at, shortly after we got engaged, a young woman who was in my Bible study had all, also been a friend of Ruth Ann's and in her Bible study, and um, she said, I want to take you to lunch and share something with you. And so we went to lunch, and she said, you know, about two years before Ruth Ann died, she said, um, Arden, I know that I'm not going to be here much longer. I know the Lord's getting me ready to go home, and I'm so ready to go home. Um, but I have been praying for John because he really needs to be married again. And I've been praying for his wife. And I want to ask you, and I'm asking all of my friends, if you'll pray for her. He, John needs to get married. And when you meet her, will you take her in to your group of friends and love her? And when I think back on my story, I think, like, who writes this stuff? With my train wreck of a record, who writes this kind of stuff with this kind of an ending? And I went back home and I said, Lord, I, you know, this, I, I don't know if you picked the right person here. I don't deserve this. And do any of us deserve the good things that we get? Um, and I said, I just, this is, you know, bigger than anything I could ever have imagined. And he really did knock my socks off. And I, I remember thinking, I wonder that two years before she died, when that would have been, and I kind of tried to figure out the calendar. It was about the time I hit the floor saying, I give up. I want to fall in love with you. And when I think about it now, right around the corner from me was a woman probably crying her eyes out, praying for me, praying for her husband, knowing she wouldn't be here that much longer. Probably a man crying that he couldn't do anything to help his wife. And me having a pity party, crying, and saying, Lord, have you forgotten me? I just want to fall in love with you. And that began this great big turning of the um, ocean liner in the direction of his love. But for him to come back and just show me what had happened in the meantime, that he was at work 
bringing me somebody who was not available, you know, two years earlier, five years earlier, ten years earlier, and looking back at my track record, as I said. And the thing I love to share about all of that, and you've probably got a track record too, and maybe it's a train wreck like mine is, and maybe it's not so much of a train wreck, but here's the thing I do know. God looks at that, and he makes ministry out of that mess. He will take that mistake or whatever it is, and he will bring a beautiful message of hope if you let him, if you let him. Well, that's just a little bit of our story, and we want you to know that. But in the last uh, uh, three minutes, let me just make a, a, a remark of what we're going to do um, tonight and tomorrow night. I hope every one of you will be here. You probably won't be. You'll find other things to do. But let me, And I'll tell you another thing. The enemy, and there is an enemy, he does not want you to come tonight. He does not want you to. You'll find everything in the world, every excuse in the world, other plans, whatever, whatever, whatever. I hope you'll be there tonight and tomorrow night. You need to be there both nights because we're going to talk about and equip, and equip you to be able to have an impact the rest of your life that 99% of all believers in this city and around the country are not having. We're going to talk about a subject that Jesus said that he wanted every true believer to be engaged in, not as an option, but as a command. I have a friend that I just, I have six men that I'm discipling every week one-on-one. -on -one. And these are all young studs from 28 to 35. And I mean, they're going to turn Dallas upside down in the days to come. And one of them I finished spending a year with just back in, just before Christmas. And Jason came in the other day and he said, uh, John, I finally found the man I'm going to build my life into now that you've built your life into me. Because that's the requirement. If I spend time with you and build a year into you, I can't do it unless you can make a commitment on the front end that you'll do the same with somebody else and you'll do it the rest of your life. That's what Jesus expects. So I said, why did the guy that you got, the, that, why did he make the, the, the uh, agreement to do this? He said, well, first of all, he said, I don't think I can do it. And then I'm, he called me up a week later when I said, pray about it. He said, you know what turned the tables for me? He says, when I understood that this was a command by Christ, not an option. So if I turn my back on him and don't do this, I'm basically living in disobedience. That's strong, but that's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. And I know all you people love Jesus. If you love Jesus, you obey Jesus. So you need to be there tonight, tomorrow night. There's already a movement going in this church from the last two times I've been here. And Steve will comment on that. And Bill Tucker's meeting with people, discipling people. Steve is. Other people in this church are but it needs to explode all over the city and so we'll talk about that uh, tonight and tomorrow night so steve you mm -hmm. want to come up and kind of wrap it up first of all uh john and punky thank you so much for willing to uh, your willingness to <laughs> share your story to do it uh, graciously honestly that can be a little scary sometimes mm -hmm. and uh to help us um, <coughs> um know you well and love you more we appreciate that we appreciate Sorry. that very much um, yes tonight we will get into uh, some of the details of how it is that we cre uh, we craft our story how we share that story with others and uh, as, as a blessing to them and we begin this evening at six o'clock uh, we'll be finished we'll start promptly we'll end promptly which will be at 8 30 and then um, uh, tomorrow night we will start at 6.30, and we will end promptly at 9 o'clock. So uh, it'll be a wonderful uh, thing to hear from both John and from Punky as they talk about their experience of uh, this business of disciples who are making disciples. Thank you for being here this morning for all of this. Uh, we will have some materials that are available uh, through the evening uh, conferences. Uh, we do have some of the books that uh, some of you have requested. How do we get hold of the book, The Four Priorities? And those books are here yet even now. But um, we want to wrap things up for our time together this morning. Again, I appreciate you being here because at the end of the day, this is what it really is. It's J2E3. Mm -hmm. It's Jesus to everyone, everywhere, yeah. every day. And that's how we enter into our day. That's how we follow. That's how we who love Jesus roll. And so uh, we want to be a part of uh, encouraging, informing, and uh, supporting.
that here amongst us uh, in the reach that Concordia has into the community, into the city, and, and beyond, wherever that may be. Everyone, everywhere, every day. Amen. Let's pray about that. Thank you, Father, for our time together this morning. We do pray your blessing upon John and Punky, and thank you for them coming to share not just their story, but also the insights of how we can be a part of, uh, of a multiplication process that was in the heart of Jesus when he spoke to those who, who followed him in, uh, in, in an ancient world and said, make disciples of all peoples. And we want to be a part of that. We want to be glad to say yes and to press hard into that gracious invitation that is simply, follow me. Jesus, to everyone, everywhere, every day. Father, may this prayer be our way of saying, I'm in. And as we offer this prayer, we're praying in his strong and precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.